Okay, good afternoon. God bless you, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this week's broadcast in our prophetic mentoring and counseling Facebook live group. This week's topic is um, we're going to do an in-depth study on the word of wisdom, the word of wisdom. Um, this is found in uh, I'm just hold on. I'm trying to get another recording device going because you just never know when things go crazy when you're trying to record live you know it's good to have a backup um give me just a minute just a minute good afternoon hello everybody god bless you god bless you i hope you have your bibles or um you certainly want to go back and and, and have your notes and things with you because we're going to have a lot of scripture um for you today even if you know what the word of wisdom is, this will serve as a good refresher for you. If you don't know, you will learn today. And this may be a gift that if you don't already have operating in your life, you want to you definitely want to ask God to um, impart that gift to you. So I'm, I was trying to find another um, thing on my laptop to record this because uh, in Charlotte, it's raining and you just never know what weather and, you know, your stuff gets cut off. Um, so I'm trying to get a backup and it's taken so long to load. Um, all right. And we're ready to roll. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> As you can tell, I am still wrestling with this cough. It just does not want to leave, but nevertheless, um, today's topic is the word of wisdom. And, uh, I, like I said earlier, I, I believe that it's going to enlighten a lot of you and it may even stir up some of these gifts that are in you that you didn't know that you had. All right. Let's go to first Corinthians chapter 12 and I'm going to read verses eight through 11. Now, like I said earlier there, um, this teaching is going to have a lot of scripture. Uh, so um, I'll go back in and, and share it once I'm done with the video. I'll edit it and include all of the scriptural notes, references, so that you can reference it in your own devotion time. Perhaps you know someone who's operating in the um, spiritual gift of the word of wisdom and they don't really know what that thing is. Um, you can help them. You can help them uh, tap into that and maximize the potential. You want to maximize the potential of every spiritual gift that you have. OK, it's not only going to benefit you, but it's going to benefit the kingdom of God. OK, first Corinthians, chapter 12, verses eight through 11. For to one is given by the spirit, the word of wisdom to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another, the gifts of healing. OK, so we see multiple gifts of healing. We'll talk about that one day by the same spirit to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers, di diverse or diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But all of these work that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. Again, that came out of first Corinthians chapter 12, verses eight through 11, where Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a very gifted, very spiritual church, um, but they had problems. OK, so don't ever get it twisted that just because you're spiritual that you can't have flesh problems. OK, they were sleeping with one another. They were um, they there was a church that had gifts, but they didn't have love in operation. So you don't want to fall under that. Um, you know, you don't want to fall victim to that. OK, so don't ever think that being gifted is a substitute for developing character. I need to say that again. Don't ever think that being gifted, whether you're prophetically gifted, whether you're whatever your gift is, never look at your gift as a substitute for developing character. Because you can be gifted. The gifts come without repentance. And this is why we find many among us who are very gifted people, but their character stinks. OK, um, and the only time people want to be around you is when your gift is in operation. And when your gift is not in operation, uh, they don't want to be bothered by you. Let me turn this volume up. Let me uh, you guys let me know if you can hear me. Jaleesa says she can't hear. So let me know if you're having problems with the audio. OK, let me um, adjust my stuff to turn my media settings up. OK. All right. Um. So the, the, the nine spiritual gifts, and let me just say this. Um, I'm not saying that just because Paul taught on the nine spiritual gifts that there are only nine spiritual gifts. 
You know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't believe that, you know, this is just me talking. I don't believe that God limited the expression of the Holy Ghost to nine gifts. And I believe that in whichever areas that the Lord decides to use a person, though it may not be emphatically made clear, I still believe that the Holy Spirit of God can use a person to do a thing. So I, I just don't want to limit the expression or the manifestation to the spirit of God, to these nine gifts, because late, uh, there's a scripture in Isaiah, and this is Old Testament, where Isaiah talked about the sevenfold spirits of the Lord. And let me see if I can pull that up really quick without losing my place with where I am. Um, still waiting for you guys to confirm. OK, good that you can hear me. Good, Jaleesi. I'm glad because I think this is going to help you, young woman of God. Um, there is a um, let me try to find this really, really quick. Um, where Isaiah said this, and this is in Isaiah chapter 11, verse two notifications, Jesus, Isaiah said this in 11, uh, two, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. <coughs> Excuse me. The spirit of wisdom, where am I? I lost my place. The, of uh, the spirit of wisdom, and understanding the spirit of counsel and might and the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So the prophet Isaiah tapped into the sevenfold expressions of the spirit of God. Whereas Paul in first Corinthians chapter where we were, uh, um, 12 tapped into the nine spiritual gifts. So that's why I said that I don't want to just limit the expression of the spiritual gifts to just nine. And I'm not trying to add, I'm not, not trying to add to the Bible, but what I'm just saying is God, is, he's too great to confine himself. And so just because Paul identified these nine spiritual gifts that were operating in the church of Corinth, I just, I, 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 mm, let me put this tactfully. I don't feel that God can restrict himself to just those nine gifts. Perhaps it was the nine gifts that were operating in Corinth. You know what I'm saying? Perhaps these are the nine gifts that are available. You know, I, I don't know. I just, I just feel based on uh, Isaiah chapter 11, um, that when Isaiah taps into the sevenfold expressions of the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord, okay, the spirit of the wisdom of the Lord, the spirit of the understanding of the Lord, the spirit of the counsel of the Lord, the spirit of the might of the Lord, the spirit of the knowledge of the Lord, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah picked that up and, and, and wrote that in 11 verse 2. So we find here that even though Paul identified these nine spiritual gifts, Based on what Isaiah identified, and I know Isaiah's Old Testament, this is before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, but Isaiah also pointed out that there are also seven outpourings or manifestations or expressions. So, you know, that's kind of a theological thing, and I don't want to, you know, bog you down with that. But anyway, that's just my rambling, so let me get out of there. Um, but at any rate, so Paul uh, identified these nine gifts, and if we would divide these gifts into categories, we have three different categories of the operation of these spiritual gifts. Now, let me just dis put this out here in preface all of this by saying you first have to be filled with the Holy Spirit to um, to have access to these gifts. OK, he said from the very beginning, these are given by the spirit. So there are people who have natural gifts and natural talents. OK, there's three types of wisdom. There's a man's wisdom, there's a worldly wisdom, and there's a God's wisdom. OK, the man, the man's wisdom is man's thoughts and his know-hows. The word wisdom of the world is sensual, it's devilish, the Bible says. Okay, it's, it's based upon the Babylonian system, make more, get more, numbers is power. That's a worldly system of wisdom. Um, you know, uh, but the godly wisdom is that direct wisdom that comes from the mind of God. So there are three categories where the nine gifts that Paul outlines fall into. There are three categories. There are the power gifts, the revelation gifts, and the utterance gifts. I'm going to say that again, three categories that out of these nine spiritual gifts that Paul outlined in first Corinthians 12, eight, that they fall under three primary categories. Number one, the power gives number two, the revelation gives number three, the utterance gives. Now I'm going to get into the word of wisdom, but you know, we got to lay some ground, uh, groundwork here and give you some type of theological, um, uh, framework to, to, to build on. You got to have, you know, as an apostle, you got to build. So you got to have stuff to build with. Okay. Um, the power gifts are going to, are going to, uh, represent the gifts that actually do something. You know, you're going to see those in manifestation. And these are the gifts of faith, the gifts of healing and the working of miracles. Now, when you look at the gifts of faith, and let me tell you something, just because Paul identified these gifts in the old in the New Testament does not mean that we don't see these gifts. Most of them, seven out of nine 
I found are already operating in the Old Testament. The only thing different um, with the outpouring of the spirit because listen, just because the Holy Ghost outpoured is poured out now in this dispensation, it doesn't mean that he was mute. You know what I'm saying? That he was under arrest in the Old Testament. From the very beginning, the Lord reveals to us that the Holy Spirit was present. Okay. This is from Genesis chapter one. So we see that the Holy Spirit was already there. We just don't see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as a resident, uh, as a, as, um, resident in the life of the believer until the New Testament. OK, because in the Old Testament, they were under the law. Jesus had to come rip the veil and give us access so that we could go to the father in Jesus name. The Old Testament folk could not do that. They had to go to the priest. Amen. And to the prophets. OK, but now in this dispensation, Jesus, this is why we thank God for Jesus, that we can go and access the throne of God boldly. And we do that in Jesus name. So Jesus came in and he oh, he tore the veil. Amen. He ripped the petition and he allowed us access uh, in his name to the father and he granted us permission to receive the Holy Ghost and this is where the adoption into the body of Christ came from again this is heavy theological um, framework here I don't want to lose any of you because I don't really know where a lot of you are uh, you know in terms of the meat of the word okay but there are some precepts to certain things that uh, that needs to take place in our life and in the corporate body of Christ so you got to have the Holy Ghost. You have to be filled with the Holy Ghost of God to operate in these gifts. It's not enough to be saved. It's not enough to be on a church roll. You know what I'm saying? You must be filled with the Holy Spirit and then the Spirit of God will divide or appoint or assign these spiritual gifts to you. Now, let me say this. These, I guess this should be spiritual gifts 101, huh? These spiritual gifts are will be divided to you or assigned to you based upon your call and your purpose. So if you are, for, for the sake of this group, we are a prophetic group. We've got prophets here. We've got prophetic people here among many others. But for the, you know, the, 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 the main thrust of it, we're dealing with prophetic people. So prophetic people, you're going to need access to. To these gifts that Paul made uh, mention of in first Corinthians chapter 12 verse 8 through 11 okay you're gonna need you may not need the power gifts but you're definitely gonna need the utterance gifts the utterance gifts are the prophecy the divers tongues and the interpretation of tongues you're gonna have to be able to hear what God is saying and articulate it so that's the power the, the utterance gifts and I told you what the power gifts are the gifts of faith the gifts of healing and the working of miracles um I just let me just go into this for a minute. I just have to as a teacher. I got to get in there. When you look at uh, how these gifts were being used in the Old Testament, each of these. Um, we see seven out of these nine gifts being used in the Old Testament. Each of these gifts were being used in the Old Testament, with the exception of the divers tongues and the interpretation of tongues. So we see seven spiritual gifts that were operating in the Old Testament even before the dispensation of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. The difference is these were not resident gifts. And when I say resident gifts, what I mean is they would rest upon a person to accomplish the assignment that God had, had destined them to. And when the work was done, the spirit lifted. But now in the New Testament, under this disp dispensation of grace, this church age, we these gifts live on the inside of us out of our bellies flow rivers. So that's the difference in the Old Testament. You will see, uh, for example, um, and I, I wrote this in my, my notes. Hang on. I'll give it to you as soon as I come across it. Um, we'll see different individuals who operated in these gifts in the Old Testament. Where are my notes? Hold on. Let me pull this up for you guys because I want you to, um, I don't want you to think that this just started when Paul said it. These um, gifts have an operation um, before that. When you look at the word of wisdom, which we're going to talk extensively about today, Moses operated in a word of wisdom. When you look at the word of knowledge, Joseph and Daniel operated in the word of knowledge. When you look at the gift of faith, Joshua operated in the gift of faith when you look at the gifts of healing and and again out of all the gifts you know you find the the power gifts are multiple gifts gifts of faith gifts of healing those of you who are who are uh, uh god is using in deliverance you're you you're using the gift of healing that's why it's a mo it's a it's a multi-dimensional multi-faceted gift 
of healing. It's not just one. There's healing of emotions where God may use you in therapy. There's healing of marriage, you know, healing in marriages. The, the healing gift, and we'll talk about that maybe in a couple of weeks, is so, it's such a broad category. It's not just Benny Hinn taking crutches from people and putting it up on a wall on display. We thank God for Benny Hinn. We thank God for his gift of healing. But I don't want you to limit that. You know, you know I don't want you to limit um, gifts to just one operation. There are many streams by which these spiritual gifts can flow in. So when you look at the gift of, of, um, of healing, uh, you're talking about deliverance. We're talking about physical healing. Those of you who are working in the healthcare industry, you're using that gift. Nurses, uh, you know, doctors and, you know, physical therapy. You are using your gift in the marketplace or in the workplace. We, remember we talked about that last week, Mark profits in the workplace and all that stuff. <clears throat> we helped a lot of you guys because some of y'all had flight. You were ready to leave your jobs. And listen, I received all kind of feedback from that. They were like, thank God. Now and I get it. I don't have to quit. You know, I can, I can, I understand. I can hang on to this for a minute. And even in that, I use the word of wisdom. Okay. That's one of the gifts that are very strong in my life out of many, praise God. But the word of wisdom is very strong in my life. And so that's the gift that I use to counsel. That's the gift. I counsel out of the word of wisdom. I, I, I preach and I prophesy out of the word of wisdom so, because it brings solutions. And I, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let me kind of get back here and show you some of the Old Testament usages of, <laughs> of, the, um, of the gifts. And then we'll get into word of wisdom. All right. So Moses moved in the word of wisdom. Joseph and Daniel moved in the word of knowledge. Joshua moved in the gift of faith. Remember, he stealed the people. They were ready to, you know, they was and all this grasshoppers and they're people bigger than us. And it was Joshua said, hey, we can do it. And you know what the Bible called Joshua? A man of a different spirit. He and Caleb, they had a different spirit. It was a gift of faith. People with the gift of faith have a different spirit. When you when you have a situation that seems uh, just overbearing and overwhelming, you need somebody with the gift of faith. And these are radical people. Faith filled people are right. They will do anything. I mean, they are just, <laughs> and you'll find a lot of those of you who have the evangelistic uh, mantle. A lot of you operate in faith. Stephen in the New Testament operated in faith. He would just, they're, they're, they are daredevils. And I mean, you know, not to use that word, but I don't know another better word to use. But they, they are risk takers. People with faith, they believe God for anything. You know what I'm saying? So if people of faith are really good people to be around. I'm telling you, uh, they, they'll ignite something in you. They'll still, let me tell you, they'll, they'll, they'll catch you on fire. <coughs> um, so gifts of healing. I was talking about how this moves in many streams, deliverance, physical healing, mental healing, um, marriage healing, relationship healing, you know, there's so many areas of healing that we don't want you to get stuck. People of God don't get stuck. Amen. Um, so Elisha moved in the gifts of healing, right? Moses with the brazen serpent, all of that stuff. Um, with the working of miracles, Elisha always, um, also worked in miracles. It was a floating ax. Um, the axe that dropped in the water, it was a borrowed axe head. And so Elisha uh, uh, told them what an axe head was. Uh, there was another time there was death in the bowl of a pot. The people were dying. Oh, uh, no, no, excuse me. They, the prophets were afraid that there was a poison in the bowl. And Elisha came up with this concoction of meal. He said, throw meal in the bowl and, and the people ate it. And nobody died. You know what I'm saying? So that's the working of miracles. Also in conjunction with the working of healing. Do you see how that works together? Okay. Um, the, then you have the gift of prophecy. We all need that. We should have that. Okay. Prophets especially need the gift of prophecy. Now, the gift of prophecy doesn't make you a prophet. It makes you prophetic. You have a tendency to hear God and to articulate what he's saying. But it doesn't mean that you have the office of the prophet. The office of the prophet is a governmental leadership position. Okay. So don't, don't get that twisted. Don't get that twisted. There's a gift that, that God uses you and you are awesome. You're prophetic and you can prophesy till the cows come home. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you are called to leadership to the government in the kingdom. All right. So uh, and, and you will best perform where you're graced. I need to say that again. You will best perform where you are graced. OK, so and the seventh gift is the discerning of spirits. Samuel had that. Remember when the voice called him and he was trying to figure out who was calling him. And then also when God spoke to him about Eli, Samuel knew not to, you know, what not to say to Eli. He had a discerning. He had this gift operating. 
So I, I wanted to show you that these first seven gifts were already operating in the Old Testament believers, even before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But during the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, now we all have access to that. Now it's, it's up to us. You know, even Paul said, covet the best gift, desire, earnestly desire gifts. Some people just happy to be saved and love Jesus and that's that. But I maintain to tell you, there is more. There's more available to you. And so maybe your gift, you may have the gift of faith. You can believe God for all things, but there are other gifts that are available to you that you need to seek God for. And you seek God for it in prayer and it comes to you either. In, and I'm going to teach on this one day. You can receive an impartation in a dream. But there's also the laying on of hands, and I'm going to give you scripture for that in a little bit, where you can receive an impartation of a gift. Okay? So it definitely helps if you're in a ministry setting where your leaders can hear God, where your leaders are flowing. Because, listen, you can't impart what you don't have. So you, it, it, it's, it's best to be in a, a setting to where you see these gifts in operation. You know what I'm saying? Where, where you see them working according to biblical protocol and that you have leadership that can impart and release that grace unto you. OK, uh, so so Samuel operated in the discerning of spirits. So did Elisha operated in the discerning of spirits. And then, like I said, the diverse tongues and interpretation of tongues. You didn't see those um, it occurring in the Old Testament. So those are the only two gifts out of the nine that Paul mentioned in First Corinthians 12, 8 through 11 that we don't see manifesting in the Old Testament. The other seven we do. I just told you I just gave examples for that. All right. Moving right along. Hope I didn't give you all too much. This is why you've got to. Um, you know, because we only have so much time because I'm in the middle of my work day. So, you know, I only have so much time to to give this to you guys. So <clears throat> this is why I try to upload them to YouTube so you can listen to them at work. When you're doing your exercise routine or you're fixing your dinner breakfast, put your headphones in and just listen to it. Let this word sink into your spirit because it's going to grow you. It's going to mature you. And, and you can receive impartation through these teachings. All right. So I gave you the nine, the three different categories that these nine gifts fall into the power gifts that do something, the gift of faith, gift of healing, get working of miracles. I told you about the revelation gifts. No, I didn't. Sorry. <laughs> the revelation gifts are the gifts that reveal something. And so the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge and the discerning of spirits are all revelation gifts. They reveal the heart of the father, the mind of the father. OK, they reveal the um, thoughts of the father toward his people. So um, there are people who operate in these gifts naturally. I mean, you know what I'm saying? There are some people that just they have that natural inclination to do things. And it doesn't mean that they received it from the spirit of God because they're not filled with the spirit. But there's a natural gift. Uh, and you may say, wow, this person has the gift of gab, which is really faith. Or you may say this person is just a smart aleck. You know, they're a jack of all trades. Well, that's the spiritual gift of knowledge. But because they haven't tapped into that, they, they can only go but so far. They can only go but so far. OK. Um, praise God. So I'm sorry. I just got distracted. My children have ordered pizza and the pizza guys here and they're downstairs. Please hold on for a moment. You got to love it. Praise God. Okay. I'm back. Thank you for that. Um, so, <coughs> so the gift of the, uh, the word of wisdom is not just, um, you know, we don't just see it operating in the new Testament. I'm going to give you some examples in the old Testament where we see that gift in operation. And listen, the old Testament, uh, helps us. I know that a lot of people who are afraid of the old Testament, they can't pronounce the words. A lot of it seems like it's in riddles. Um, there are a lot of stories. They can't really make out what's happening. And so there are many people who, who shy away from the old Testament. I know preachers that won't preach the old Testament period. And there are some people who have just condemned the old Testament. They figured, well, Jesus came, we don't need it, but let me share something with you. Uh, the old Testament in the Old Testament, you learn the ways of God. You learn God's nature. You, you learn God's likes. You learn God's dislikes because you see his involvement with man that you don't see in the New Testament. You know what I'm saying? You see God's involvement in the Old Testament like you that you don't see in the New Testament. And the New Testament, you see more activity. You see industry. You see coming together. You see buildings. And you, there's a lot of doctrine. Because, of course, the church is being established and there's a foundation that has to be laid. That's why the apostles wrote the New Testament. So there's a foundation that has to be laid. But in the Old Testament, this is why you got to have them both, people of God. The Old Testament shows you the heart of God. It shows you how God works. 
Okay, so let me give you some Old Testament examples of how the word of wisdom or the gift of wisdom, I should say, was operating. And then um, we'll move on into the New Testament and talk about how that gift is going to work in you. All right. Daniel chapter five, verse 11. uh, The Bible says that there was a man in the kingdom and who there is a man in the kingdom in whom is the wisdom of the holy gods. Now, of course, they didn't know, you know what I'm saying? This was a report coming from heathen. So, you know, they didn't know how to identify who our God is, but they knew they could not deny his wisdom. Wisdom is a gift that people cannot deny. They may not like you, but they cannot deny the gift of wisdom. People will listen to you. They may not even like you. They may not even like what you're saying, but wisdom is an undeniable gift because wisdom solves a problem. Okay, wisdom brings insight. Wisdom brings peace. Wisdom brings unity. Wisdom is the anecdote for division. When when there is a couple who's contending and and bickering, and and I pray this this is not in your home, but when someone enters in the home with wisdom, they're able by the grace and the anointing of God And this is where the word of wisdom, word of knowledge and discerning, they all work together. Remember, I told you these are the revelation gifts. They are all working together, right, for a a common cause. And their job is to, wisdom's job is to go in and to to break up the fallow ground and, and relay a foundation of peace. And so when a person with wisdom walks, wisdom has the ability to walk in and settle all discord. Because wisdom's voice, remember the Bible's how wisdom cries out in the street. If you look in Proverbs and we know the book of, listen, oh my God, you got to study Proverbs. Proverbs is just, Proverbs is wisdom. And we know that Solomon, for the most part, wrote the majority of the book of Proverbs. Um, and, and listen, he, put him back on the chain. He wrote that because of the, <laughs> oh, this is so deep. My God. Solomon received an impartation of wisdom in his dream. Okay, and this is what I said to you earlier. You can receive impartations in your dream. This is why I tell you people don't, don't, you know, don't throw your dreams away. Pay attention. Write them down, because many times God will reveal things to you in dream. Don't you know it wasn't a dream that Joseph received, not not Joseph, Jacob received his impartation for next level ministry or next level living when the angels came and descended? I mean, that's another teaching. God, I don't want to get into that. But anyway, you know, each of us have a charge of angels that are assigned to our life. For a certain purpose, for a certain time, for a certain season, when time, when, when God is shifting you and and when you're being transitioned from one level to another, that there's a changing of the guards. I know many of you have heard that term and, and many of us have equated it to church stuff, but let me, that's a spiritual term that there is a changing of the guards that takes place when there's a transition in your life. And so the, the previous order of angels, uh, are not equipped to cover you in this next level, in this next place. Okay. So this is why a lot of times there's such a shaking. Here we go into the prophetic. Okay. This is why many times, many of you, when, when there's a shift taking place in your life and there's a transition taking place in your life, you see a lot of shaking and a lot of just a lot. It looks like a lot of noise. And I taught you about that in coming out of Ezekiel. It looks like a lot of noise, but I'm, what I'm maintaining to tell you is that there's a, there's a changing of the guards taking place. The demons that used to be attached to you, you know, they can't touch you on that next level. The angels that covered you are are not equipped for the next level. So you see a lot of changes taking place in the natural and also in the realm of the spirit. And so in Jacob's case, amen, when when he fell upon that, he, he laid his head on the rock. The rock represented Jesus. And he called the place Bethel, the house of God. And as he laid his head on a rock, he went into a dream. And in this dream, he received impartation for next level ministry. In this dream, there was the heavens open over him and the angels ascended and descended. The angels that were accompanying him after he left Isaac's house, went back to the father, awaiting the next assignment. And a new order of angels came down to equip him and to support him for this next assignment in Laban's house. Now you gotta look in, you gotta, uh, I did a, I, I do a prophetic Bible studies and I'm still in Genesis. I've been in Genesis for over a year <laughs> because there's so much. But I talk about that in, um, in, in my prophetic Bible studies. So there, there comes a changing of the guards when seasons are changing in your life. 
Okay, so this is why there's a lot of noise, uh, there's a lot of turbulence and so forth. And that's why you just have to stand still when that's happening and let let God process you. Okay. Hallelujah. Um, I don't even know where I went, how I, I don't even know how I got there. Anyway, so there was this man in the kingdom in whom was the wisdom of the holy gods, and this man's name was Daniel. And so we see Daniel had this wisdom in him, uh, and this was before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was that wisdom that promoted him to stand beside Nebuchadnezzar. It was the wisdom that gave him access to the throne. So this is what wisdom cannot be denied. Wisdom cannot be denied. So in Exodus chapter 28, verse three, you find that when God began to give Moses the pattern to build the temple, God has specific instructions for who he wanted to be a part of that process. Now, hear me very closely. Hear me very carefully. When you are in a building stage in your life, whether you're building ministry, building your family, building your career, building your business or your network, you need people who are, uh, 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 who operate or who are manifesting the word of wisdom. Okay. When you are building, you need people in your life who operate in this word of wisdom, in the gift of the word of wisdom. And I'm giving you scripture for this, okay? This is found in Exodus chapter 28, verse 3. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted. Listen, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. So where does that gift come from? It comes from God, the spirit of wisdom, not just the, the man's wisdom. We're not talking about man's wisdom. We're talking about the spirit of wisdom. The Lord said, whom I have filled. And he calls these individuals wise hearted. And he's talking to Moses and he's telling Moses, who was a, 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 an apostle before his time. OK, he's telling Moses, we're about to build something. We are about to do something and we're about to pioneer a new move. But in order for me to facilitate that, Moses, you are going to need wise men in your employ, in your circle, in your realm of influence. And so in Exodus chapter 31, verse three, remember, I told you we got a lot of scripture. OK, because I need to uh, I, I don't know when I'm going to get back to this. So we're going to have to just get deep into it. OK, in Exodus chapter 31, 31, verse three, the Bible says, and I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. So now you find here the leader, Moses, is filled with the Spirit of God. Remember I told you this was in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. So this is why I, I, I said, this is what I kind of based my premise on, that when we find in in, in second in what what I said, in First uh, Corinthians 12, 8, 11, I, I don't want to limit the spiritual gifts to just nine. Because in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, he identifies seven more. So that's at least 16. Okay. So now here's what God says about Moses in Exodus chapter 31, verse 3. He said, I filled him with the spirit of God. Moses had a specific assignment. He needed to be filled with the spirit of God to facilitate that assignment. And not only was he filled with the spirit of God, according to Exodus 31, 3, he had wisdom. He had understanding. He had knowledge and he had all manner of workmanship. So in order for Moses to facilitate this work, that this was a great undertaking to whom much is given, much is required. So in order to facilitate this great work, this pre apostolic pioneering work that Moses was 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 assigned and tasked to do in the wilderness to build a nation of Israel, he first needed to be filled with the spirit of God. And listen, immediately after being filled with the spirit of God, he needed wisdom. And then behind wisdom comes understanding. Because there are many who have knowledge. Don't you know a lot of smart people that are, uh, praise God. <laughs> a lot of smart people that are silly. Let me put it like that. I just had to pull my words back in. But there, there are a lot of smart people who, um, have you ever just met somebody just so smart and, 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 you know what I'm saying? But have no common sense. Have you ever, I, you know, I've come across people that they're just, they, they're knowledgeable about everything and they just have no common, just silly because it's book knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. 
it's book knowledge, but they don't have the word. They don't have the word of knowledge. And that's something I don't we'll talk about that another time. But anyway, on the heels of Moses being filled with the spirit of God, he needed to be filled with the spirit of wisdom and then understanding and then knowledge. So it's not enough to be book smart. It's not enough to quote scriptures. It's not enough to be, you know, it's, it's not enough for that. You got to be filled with the spirit of God first. And then you need wisdom and then you need understanding and then you use your knowledge. Because if you get knowledge without the spirit of God, you become arrogant. You become puffed up like the Bible says. If you get knowledge without the wisdom, then you don't know how to apply your knowledge. And you will misapply knowledge because you need wisdom. Wisdom teaches you. Wisdom provides the practical application for knowledge. It shows you how to use your knowledge. It shows you where to use your knowledge. It shows you when to restrain yourself. Okay, so so in Exodus 31, 3, let me finish this. Filled with the spirit of God, wisdom, understanding, knowledge and all manner of workmanship. So in order for Moses to um, to lead and to facilitate this great move, he first needed to have what it takes to get it done. And he would be the one to impart the gifts on those that God was going to use to help him get the work done. Does that make sense? So in order for him to to call people to the work. You first had to be endowed with the grace to get the work done, because how can you invite people into your vision and you don't have understanding of your vision? You don't have the capability to execute your own vision. So God had to endow Moses with that first. Now, let's move on down to Exodus chapter 35, verse 31. So we find God has given Moses the wisdom and knowledge and God gives Moses the capacity to get things done. He gives him the mind, amen, the know how to think. And to put some things together. And so in Exodus chapter 35, 31, here we go again. And he has filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of, 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 of workmanship. Move now here to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. The Bible's talking about Joshua. Now we know who Joshua is. Joshua was Moses' successor. Joshua was Moses's armor bearer and personal minister, ministry attendant or whatever adjective, whatever name you want to put on it today. That's who Joshua was. OK, Joshua. Listen to what the Bible says about Joshua. The Bible says, and Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Why? Because Moses laid his hands upon him. And as a result, the children of Israel listened to him. And did as the Lord commanded Moses. So we find here that in leadership, it is essential that the word of wisdom is operating in your life. Because for those that you're going to impart, those that you're going to train, those who you're going to develop and raise up, you're going to you, you will be required to impart the same thing that you have to the next breed, the, the, those who arise and coming up the ranks. We find that here. So the word of wisdom is, is, is essential for those operating in leadership. Joshua was next in line, next in command for Israel. And so it was Joshua's assignment to not be distracted, to not be deterred. This is why the Bible said Joshua had a different spirit. He could not have the same spirit as the rest of the people. Now, I'm not saying that he was better than anybody else. I don't, I don't ever preach elitism. I don't ever do that. But what I'm saying is Joshua took advantage of the season that God had given him. And Joshua so closely aligned himself that Joshua received an impartation through the laying on of hands from Moses. I also believe that Joshua received impartation just by observing Moses's life, studying his characteristics and studying his um, his mannerisms. So we find here that in the Old Testament. Because in 2 Timothy, Paul talks about Timothy, you know, stir up the gift that has been uh, laid, of, that's been, uh, that's been um, uh, stir up the gift that was given to you by the laying on of hands. So you find that the laying on of hands to receive impartation was not restricted to the New Testament. We find that in the Old Testament as well. Moses was the first person who laid hands and imparted spiritual gifts. Okay. Hope I'm not losing anybody. So now um, we find Joshua is filled with the wisdom through the laying on of Moses. Uh, <clears throat> and let's move on now to Proverbs chapter two, verse six. Again, Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. I strongly encourage you to read it. If that's what one, if, if your gift is a word of wisdom, you really want to park yourself in, in, in Proverbs for a minute. 
and, and just kind of hear the heart of the father and see how wisdom speaks. Learn how wisdom speaks. Learn what wisdom, because the Bible calls her a woman. Her name in the Greek is Sophia. It's Sophia. So, you know, learn how wisdom speaks. She's elegant. She's not loud. She's not boy. Wisdom has a, um, a, a persona. Wisdom has a personality. When you have wisdom, you don't have to, like I said earlier, wisdom will introduce itself. Wisdom will, will promote you. Wisdom will, is undeniable. No one can not deny a person with wisdom, but everybody denies an arrogant man and thinks they know it all. Wisdom doesn't have to do that. Wisdom is elegant. Wisdom is graceful. Wisdom is like a graceful lady. The Bible says wisdom is like a, a, a pearls. Everybody wants pearls. And they wear, you know, you wear pearls. You want it to be seen. You want, you want people to notice these pearls. So it's a gift that people should desire after, especially those of you who are in leadership. Now we find here, moving on. Let me check my notifications here and make sure y'all can still hear me and everybody's good. Whew, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. I'm still here. Just checking my things. Okay. All right. So we find here that uh, we find the word of wisdom being imparted as early in the scriptures as in the book of Exodus. We find it in the book of Deuteronomy. We find it in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter two, verse six, for the Lord gives wisdom and out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So who gives wisdom? The Lord gives wisdom. Matter of fact, James picks it up. And I love how the Old Testament and New Testament marry each other. They complement one another. James picks it up and says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. So wisdom, the gift of wisdom is a thing that you can ask God for. Father, give me wisdom. Uh, Paul picks it up in first Corinthians. He said, you know what? You can even, uh, you can win an unsaved spouse with wisdom. You know, after you sold your seed, after you dance, after you cook oxtails and seafood and lobsters and giving him chocolate or give her candy and jewelry. And, and that's, that's still not winning, you know, his heart, her heart, then ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. He said, you can win your husband by your conduct. Remember, we talked about how pro in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is an elegant necklace. Wisdom has a persona. So you can win people. As a matter of fact, he that wins souls must be wise. So those of you who are evangelists, it takes wisdom because you just can't walk up to somebody and say, hey, if you don't get saved, you're going to die and go to hell. That's not wisdom. Now you've done provoke somebody and, and, you know, God help you if they don't attack you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it takes wisdom. OK, it takes wisdom uh, when you're working with unsaved people. When you're working with people who are under demonic oppression, the Bible said walk in wisdom toward those who are without. And that word without doesn't mean those who are without wisdom. It means those who are outside of the faith. So wisdom, this is why, you know, for me, and I'm just speaking for my per myself personally, I can get along with just about anybody. You know what I'm saying? I can get along with just about anybody. I can, I can flourish in just about any environment. Because I have wisdom. God has granted me wisdom. And in wisdom, you will know what not to say. You know what to do. You, you, you will know because wisdom gives you that spiritual mind of God. It gives you that insight. And this is not knowledge. Knowledge will get you the job. Wisdom will help you keep your job. I was counseling one of my spiritual daughters last night. And I was giving her counsel out of the gift of wisdom. There's a, there's a shaking on her job and I gave her wisdom. This is what you do. You don't move. You don't pack your bags. You stand still. Okay. So let me, let me rephrase that. Cause I, I feel like I went into a whole lot of areas there. Um, the Lord gives wisdom out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Wisdom comes from God. James said, uh, uh, you know, if any man like wisdom, let him ask for God. It gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Upbraideth not means God is not going to rebuke you. He's not going to chastise you. He's not going to accuse you if you ask him for wisdom. He wants you to have it. He knows that you need to have it. If you have unsaved children, you need wisdom. If you have an unsaved spouse, you need wisdom. So you will know how to win your lost family, your unsaved family. You need wisdom. 
You can pray in tongues all day long. You can prophesy. You can preach. You can quote them every scripture that you know. But at the end of the day, it's going to be your conduct. And this is what Paul said. He said, let me pull the scripture real quick for you because somebody needs to know exactly where it is. Hang on for a minute. Um, one with the chase conversation of the wife. Come on here. Hang on, y'all. I'm here. I'm just trying to find this. <sighs> See? This is in first Peter chapter three, first Peter three and two, um, actually back it up to first Peter three and one. It says wives in the same way, submit your husbands, uh, excuse me, wives in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands, so that even if they refuse to believe the word, they will be won over without words. Did you hear that? Without words. <laughs> So you can talk to them all day. You can go to counseling all day. You can, and I, listen, I'm not saying that doesn't work, but I'm saying when it gets to that point to where it's not working, then you need to look at what Peter prescribes here in first Peter three, two, that, that, that if you have those who refuse to believe the word, they will be won over without the words by the behavior or by your wisdom, by your conduct. He said, when they see your pure, which version is this? Hold on, let me get a King James. Uh, when they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. In other words, or when they see your how uh, your conduct, your behavior, the way you carry yourself. And how do you know how to do that? By wisdom. Wisdom is the transportation device that gets you there. And now even though Peter is talking about marriages, this can apply to any relationship where you're trying to win over your unsaved somebody. Whoever your unsaved somebody is, listen, when you can't win them with your words, you can win them by your conduct, 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 excuse me. And, and wisdom will show you how to do that. Wisdom will show you how to succeed in, in some of the most narrowest and in some of the most grim, uh, grim, grim situations and circumstances. Wisdom will show you how to maneuver. Okay. Um, so that's first Peter three. And one and two and all that good stuff talking about how to win people over. All right. Um, so God wants you to have that. God wants you to have wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, ask of God, Lord, help me. God, I need wisdom. I'm, I'm, I'm making mistakes. I'm, I'm about to lose my job. Um, um, you know, I need wisdom. I need to know how to walk in. I need to know how to walk out. I need to know how to talk to this certain person. You need wisdom to know how to approach people. You need, you need wisdom to know how to approach people. Proverbs 14 and 1. The wise woman builds her house. The foolish woman takes tear it down with her hands. So you want your marriage to last? You need wisdom. And this is for both wife and husband. But I'm saying according to scripture, he's talking to the wives. But I'm saying you need wisdom. You need wisdom. Proverbs 14 1. The wise woman builds her house. So again, look at how wisdom is, is connected to building. Wisdom is con is directly connected to building. You need build. You need, as a matter of fact, the Bible said how Paul said, I'm a wise master builder. You see how those two words are connected? Wisdom. You got to have wisdom. Otherwise, you put a roof on before you got a foundation. You put windows up before you got your sheetrock. You need wisdom to know which tools to get, which you, know, you, you need wisdom. So the wise woman builds her house. She knows how to build her house. And uh, let me just, can, since we're talking about this for a minute and we do prophetic mentoring and counseling, I like to hit all of that with one. So let's, let's talk about it. If you're in a, if you're in a marriage and, and there's conflict or what have you, how do you build that? Well, you first need to know the heart of your spouse. You need to know what, what it, you know, what is it that's going to set him off? What is it that's going to set her off? And then you know what wisdom says? Don't do that. Wisdom will teach you how to approach people. Even the most unapproachable people, wisdom, Abigail, I did a teaching on this a while back. I, I can't even remember what the name of the teaching was. But anyway, it, the Bible said that Abigail was a woman of good understanding. She was a wise woman and she was married to a fool. And so in her, she had to be wise in all of her discretions and in all of her dealings because she was married to a, to a, to a fool. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are people who are married to fools. You know, they're married to a neighbor. And so in a situation like that, God has not released you to run. 
You know, because, you know, we love to do that. Well, I, you know, God, I'm too anointed for this. And I, you know, I, I'm I, I'm out of here. OK, well, you you just forfeited, you know, your assignment. You don't know what God was going to do in that or what God had for you. You don't know. So you can't always take off and run when when the when you know what I'm saying? You can't always take off and run when when God is requiring you to stand. And I'm not saying to you that every circumstance is, you know, let me tell you, life is rough, people. Life is tough. <laughs> Take it from me. Life is going to hit you with some things that will make you want to pack your bags. I, I was talking about that a few days ago on one of my um, broadcasts where you will be tempted to run. And there will be people who will help. Listen, you know, <laughs> we're in Black History Month, just to kind of give you some context. And, and we know Harriet Tubman. She had the Underground Railroad. There will be people who will, listen, you will, listen, there will be some Harriet Tubmans coming to you in certain seasons of your life saying, hey, I'll show you how to get out of here. But that may not be your answer. That may not be the thing that God has for you to do. You got to go to God for yourself and say, Father, should I stay or should I go? You understand what I'm saying? And, and not just take off because somebody has made an escape route available for you. Now, I don't know who that was for because that just came. I don't know where Harry Tubman came. But I'm just saying. There are some people that are looking for, you know, if the first when I get my income tax check, I'm out of here. You know what I'm saying? And you've already planned your escape route and you don't know what God was going to do. Paul said, how do you know, old wife, whether you should save you? How do you know? You don't know because you took off too quick. Again, now I'm not saying that God is telling you to stay, but what I am saying is you need to ask God what to do. Because some seasons you may have to rough it out. And in your roughing it out, you are qualifying for a next season of breakthrough. And can't nobody tell you that better than me. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So in some seasons, uh, wisdom will teach you, okay, it's time to go. The Bible said, good man's steps are ordered by the Lord. Wisdom will teach you, okay, it's time to go. Wisdom says, sit down and be quiet. So you got it. When you, when you have a, a marriage that is, that's experiencing some type of conflict, you need wisdom. The Bible said a foolish woman tears it down. And a, you don't have to be a woman to be foolish. You can be a foolish man. Okay, you can be a foolish man and just just tear the whole house down, tear your whole marriage down. And then once it falls apart, now you're asking God to send you somebody else. Why would God do that? Why would God? Let, can I ask somebody a question? This is a hypothetical question. Okay, if you're single and you're seeking God for a mate, because not every single person desires marriage. Some people just love Jesus and they don't they don't, you know, like Paul said, that's just they, they have the gift of singleness. You know, so you don't want to assume that every single person desires a mate. That's not true. Not every single person desires marriage. Some single people just want to be sold out for Jesus, just want to focus on their career. That's not where they are. So we don't want to make that, we don't want to make that assumption, okay? Um, but let's just assume that you are single and you're seeking God for a mate. Now, this mate, depending on how old we are, let's just be real. Most times, especially us in our middle age, We've been in some type of relationship before. Most people, most people, by the time they had their forty fives and on up, uh, they've been in a relationship before. So this person is coming into your life with experience. Now, would you want to marry someone who abandoned their marriage in a season of haste? And conflict, and I mean, I, I listen, I know this is rough for me to even say it. It's probably rougher for some of you to hear it, especially if that was your thing. And I, I'm not judging because I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, just talking. We're just talking here. But would you want, if you are a person who is stable, you are, you're settled, you're established, you know, you know, you've got goals and things set in your life. Would you want to marry someone who, um, you know, has a track record for, abandoning their relationships, abandoning their marriages, jumping out when the seas get, you know, uh, you know, stirred up. Would you want that? Or would you want to connect with somebody who did everything they know they could do, who fought all the way to the end? You, so if you want somebody like that, do you think it's too much for somebody to ask the same thing of you? Now, again, this is just a hypothetical question because there are people asking God for a relationship. God, send me my Boaz, send me my man of God. But now, why would God do that if you're the type of person who would jump ship the first time there's an argument, the first time there's conflict, the first time the bills are too high? Why would God do that? So, you know, 
in some cases, and like my spiritual father says, not always the case, but in some cases, the way that we conduct ourselves may be reasons why we experience certain delays. And I, and I know you, you've been bound up every devil this side of heaven. Okay, you don't blame the devil. Devil, I bind you. Get off America. And and this is it's not always the enemy, people of God. Sometimes it's the way we talk to people. It's the way we deal with stuff. Sometimes it's the way we process things. Sometimes it's the way we drop the ball. Sometimes it's the way we abandon assignments. Sometimes it's the way we abandon people when they're in certain seasons. Some, you know, these are some mitigating factors in terms of wondering where and when your blessing is. Now, I'm going to move on out of that. OK, I'm going to move on out of that. I don't know who that was for, but there you go. OK, um, praise God. So wisdom, the Bible says <coughs> the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish one tears it down with her hand. Proverbs 24, verse three says this through wisdom, a house is built and by understanding it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increaseth strength. For by wise counsel, you will wage your own war. And in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. These are one of my, I mean, I've got a lot of favorite passages, but I really, really love this because I love wisdom. I love being around wise people. I don't, I'm not impressed by smart people. Okay. I love wise people. OK, um, so because you got to watch the camp company that you keep, that they're, they're going to make an impartation on you. Bad communication corrupts good manners. So if you want to operate in wisdom, you want to flow in wisdom, you need to be around wise people. But here in Proverbs 23, 24, three through six, um, the Bible says wisdom is the house is built by wisdom. It takes wisdom to build something. So, again, whether you're building ministry, whether you're building your relationships, whether you're building your children, whatever you're building, whatever you are building, ask yourself, Father, in Jesus name, what am I building? Give me wisdom for it. So you don't build a house that's on the sand and the minute a storm comes, everything washes away. You don't build a house on your gift because what if your gifts don't work? Then what? Then all there goes all your friends. You know what I'm saying? You don't. The only thing that you build upon is wisdom. And wisdom is going to always point you to the word of God. Uh, by, by wisdom, a house is built by understanding it is established because wisdom brings compre the ability to comprehend. That this is what settles you. You want to see a person who's settled, a person who doesn't move too easy. They have understanding. They have wisdom. If you don't have wisdom, every time trouble hits, you are running because you don't have wisdom. OK, but when you have wisdom, when you have understanding, no matter what happens, you will be you will always be left standing because you understand what's happening. You have some you have a supernatural um, insight and you have a supernatural comprehension to what's happening. So everybody else is resigning and you're looking at them like I ain't going nowhere because your wisdom kicks in and say, you know what? This storm will pass. It's a revelatory gift. It's going to reveal to you the heart and the mind of God. OK. Whew, that was a lot. All right. Let me get back to my notes. So I gave you all Exodus, gave you all Proverbs to I want to talk about. um I do want to talk about Solomon for a moment. Let me just see what that is in context of where I want to go. Um, we know that Jesus operated in wisdom and see it was wisdom that it, it was wisdom that played a role in the success of Jesus's ministry. It was wisdom because you know what? Jesus knew who to respond to and who to ignore. See, wisdom will teach you that not every answer, excuse me, that not every question requires an answer. Wisdom will teach you that. Wisdom will teach you that you don't have to respond. You don't have to prove anything. There were times when the religious rulers of Jesus day tried to trap him up. And do you know what? He would always respond in wisdom. Oh, my God. Do you remember when the, the woman caught in adultery and, and they brought her in? The, now, they didn't bring the man, but they brought the woman. Because, you know, and I'm just going to say this. Jesus had a heart for women. 
And I believe what they wanted to do was to, to cause Jesus to turn his heart against the women. Because, you know, during that day in, in Judaism, it was the men that had exalted places and exalted positions. So, but Jesus would cater to the women. I mean, he had some of his best friends were women. And so they couldn't understand that, right? He would talk to the woman at the well. They couldn't understand that. And so they brought this woman to Jesus caught in the act of adultery. Didn't bring the man. They brought the woman. But what did Jesus do? He did not respond right away. People of God, when you, when, when you possess the spirit of wisdom, the word of wisdom, the gift of wisdom, I'm using all that interchangeably, you will know when to speak and when to be quiet. I don't care what people are accusing you of and what they're saying. You will know when to be quiet. Because remember what Proverbs 24 and, and said, where did I put it? Because I printed this out so I don't have to flip through a million scriptures. Um, he said, for wise counsel, you will wage your own war. Don't you know when you have wisdom, you will know how to engage in your own wars. You will know when to go to battle and you will know when that thing will work itself out. Did you hear what I said? When you have wisdom, you will know when to go to battle and when that thing will work itself out. You, 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 you will wage your own war by wisdom. So you don't have to call the prayer warriors and the intercessors and the prophets and the bishops. Wisdom will show you exactly how to win that, how to win that thing. Wisdom showed Abigail how to win and against Nabal. Wisdom showed it to her. She couldn't tell him what she was doing. Wisdom will tell you when to speak to people and wisdom will tell you when they can't contain what you need to say. Wisdom will tell you when that person's spirit is strong enough to receive rebuke and correction and wisdom will say, you know what? They're weak right now or they're operating in some type of influence. They can't handle that. And so it, wisdom will show you how to circumvent matters. <laughs> God, you got to have wisdom. You must have wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. You must have wisdom. Abigail knew how to flow in that wisdom. When, when David was coming against her, she did not tell Nabal. She went around his back. And sometimes, sometimes wisdom will make you appear to be deceitful. Sometimes wisdom will make you appear to be deceitful. You would think, well, she's supposed to submit to her husband. She's supposed to tell her husband what she's taken out of the house. You know what I'm saying? Now think about it. Some of you and I, oh God, I got to go where God is going. I got to go with the Holy Ghost. Some of you. In marriages, the Lord may, the, the, and you're the spiritual one, okay? And the Lord may be saying to you, uh, sow a seed or send an offering or, you know, something. Listen, something you got to take out of your house. Now, I'm telling you, this is what happened with Abigail. She had to take something out of her house to spare her house. My God, that's good. She had to take something out of her house to spare her house, but she couldn't tell Nabal. Even though it was his house. It was his, come on now, this man was a wealthy man. They had servants. This wasn't just some little couple on the side in the backwoods somewhere. They had substance. They had hired men, women. She had servants. He had laborers. They, he had a storehouse. And in order to spare her house, she could not tell her husband what she was doing. She went behind his back. So wisdom will give the appearance as if you're being deceitful, but it's not, it's wisdom. It's working a work behind the scenes that you can't share because the person to whom you'll share it with will sabotage it. And so in order to spare this woman's house, Abigail had to move behind her husband and take out of her house and give to the man of God. And she brought him cakes, she brought him raisins, she brought him wine, and she laid it at this man's feet. And it was because of her giving, using wisdom, that appeased David's anger. And it halted the, uh, hold on, my dog is loose. And this is why I couldn't go live today, people of God, because I have a lot of distractions in my house. Um, nevertheless, go get that dog because that girl's walking down the street. Um, 
Yeah, so pardon me for that interruption. But anyway, she, she maneuvered behind her husband's back to save their house. And she appeased David's anger. And not only that, she qualified herself for her next breakthrough. And I, that goes without being said. It was wisdom that, that spoke to Ruth's heart to follow Naomi. Orpah didn't have that wisdom, so Orpah didn't get it. Okay? But it was wisdom that said, Ruth said, you know what? Where are you going? Ruth knew, and this woman was a Moabite. She had no theological background. She didn't know nothing about offerings and bullocks and rams and Bethlehem, Judah being the play house of bread, the house of, she didn't, she didn't know anything about that, but it was wisdom by sitting up under Naomi. And it's funny because Orpah and Ruth both sat up under Naomi, but Ruth received the impartation of wisdom. So don't get that twisted. Just because you're in the same place, doesn't mean you're going to receive the same impartation. Ruth's heart was more connected to Naomi than Orpah's was, even though they were both in the same house. Now that'll preach. But it was Ruth's heart that was more connected to Naomi that when it was time for Naomi to go, Ruth could not break away. Wisdom would not allow Ruth to break away. No matter what she had to face, no matter what she was leaving behind, wisdom would not. Wisdom spoke to Ruth and said, you know what? Where you go, I go. Your God is make up my God. Where you die, I die. Entreat me not to leave thee. This was what wisdom spoke to the heart of Ruth. And the end speaks for itself. So wisdom is such a powerful, it's such a powerful gift to have. And it's available to us by the avenue of the Holy Ghost. We need it. We need to operate in it. We need it in whatever area you're building in, you need that wisdom. Let me try to get back into my notes here, okay? Because I wandered off with that Abigail Nabel thing, but I feel like somebody needed that, okay? Oh, I was talking about, so Jesus. So Jesus has the woman caught in adultery and, and they're trying to turn him against the women. Amen. I believe the enemy knew that there was a time coming where the women apostles, the women prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists and the women deacons and the women usher that we're going to rise to the forefront. And so the enemy was trying to trap Jesus off by causing him to condemn this woman. And it would have left an indelible scar on his track record as it pertains to women in ministry. Or women in misery, should I say. So when, this, when, the, when the religious rulers brought this woman to Jesus, he didn't respond right away. He did not respond right away. He waited. The Bible says he knelt down or he bent down and he wrote in the sand. And, and you know, a lot of commentators, because I've studied that for a minute. And there were some commentators that said he wrote down the sins of everybody who was standing around him. Some other commentators have said that he... Um, was drawing a recreation of a bird or a dove or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I would just say he was just, uh, uh, you know, playing with time and waiting for the answer to come. And so that's what wisdom will do. Wisdom will teach you when, you know what, just wait a minute. Wisdom does not make you hasty. You, when, when, you're, when, you're, when you have wisdom, you don't make hasty decisions because everybody else is doing it or because you're under pressure. You understand what I'm saying? Wisdom, when, when, you, when you have a decision to make, wisdom will teach you how to pull back and just get quiet. And Jesus demonstrated that. Okay? Jesus demonstrated that in a time of, 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 of conflict or pressure, I love that word pressure. That's been my buzzword here lately. When you're in a season of pressure, you don't have to respond right away. He was under pressure. This Jesus was surrounded by religious rulers. And you can imagine all the other spectators that came around just to see and wonder what he's going to do now. And plus, if the woman was naked, go figure. OK, so you can imagine he has this audience of people who are watching him and waiting for him to respond. And what does Jesus do? He kneels down and he writes in the sand. He paused. Then another one of my buzzwords, Jesus paused. When you have wisdom, you don't have to be in a haste to say anything. You can just be quiet and wait for the Lord to speak to you. That's wisdom. A foolish person will run off at the mouth and tell you every thought they ever had. A wise person knows how to restrain their thoughts. They know when to speak. As a matter of fact, a wise person counts their words. They know that their words have value. They know that their words have weight. And they're not going to cast their pearls before swine. Neither give that which is holy to the dog. 
A wise person knows how to hold that thing in and wait until it's the proper, the appointed time and the proper time to speak. And so Jesus, after he receives clearance in his spirit, then he speaks and say, you know what? Let him that is without sin cast the first stone. That was wisdom because he didn't directly address her. He didn't directly address the issue, even though it was the issue at hand, but he went in a whole nother way that nobody seen him coming. And that's what wisdom does. Wisdom takes you when, when you respond in wisdom, you know, this, this is what I say in my opening is that wisdom, it dispels division. It dispels chaos. It's wisdom is like a light breaker. It, it, it's, it turns the light switch on when everybody's in darkness and when everybody's running around trying to figure out what we're going to do. We in chaos. We, wisdom speaks and everybody listens. When wisdom speaks, everybody listens. So when he spoke and he said, let them him that is without sin cast for a stone. Everybody was silent because you can't answer a wise man. You can't. You can't rebuke, and I, I, I'm using that term lightly, okay, a wise man. What you, how are you going to come back for that? How, how are you going to respond to that? What, you, what are you going to say? And this is why many times when Jesus was, well, have you ever found that when a wise person speaks, can't nobody say nothing? You know, sometimes my husband, with, I don't know if he's listening or not, praise God. But, you know, sometimes we have, because uh, both of us are alphas. I mean, we're both leaders. We're both headstrong. And, and, and you know, we're both visionaries. And so, yeah, go figure. But our conversations get very colorful at times. And I mean that in a respectful way. But at the end of the day, he'll say, you know what, babe? I can't win. And, and he'll just let it go. Because wisdom will speak. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't have wisdom. But I'm saying that's a grace gift in my life. And then and now I got to use wisdom in my wisdom. I don't lord it over him. You understand what I'm saying? I don't use it to usurp over him. Well, I got wisdom and you don't. And I, now that, that's a foolish woman that's going to pluck a house down. <laughs> you know, even though you're gifted and your spouse may not be, you can't use that gift against them. Now you, you operate like a foolish somebody and you can tear your stuff down and you know what they're going to say? Be careful about her. Be careful about him. They know everything. They're religious, self-righteous. So you don't want that to be said about you. So you need wisdom. And so many times we'll be debating certain things or talking about certain things or trying to figure out certain things. And, and I'll mention something and he'll look at me. He'll, he'll say, you know what? I, you got it. I, I can not win. I don't have nothing else to say. And then sometimes I say that to him, you know, babe, that I, you know, I'm speechless. So wisdom has a way when you're in a conversation with a wise person, you don't really have you don't really have a response. Because they have, you know, through the spirit of God and through the gift that operates in their life, they have tackled this insurmountable issue. They have tackled this thing that nobody else could figure out. And they give you an answer that you can't even you can't even respond to. Oh, the only thing you can do at that point is execute it and say, OK, fine, let's let's roll. Let's do it or, or not. You know what I'm saying? Depending on your pride factor. So. The, when Jesus told them, let him that is without sin, cast a person, they couldn't respond. And all you heard was stones dropping to the ground and one by one, they walked away. And then he looked at the woman and that was wisdom. He said to her, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, I have not any. And then he went on and said, you know, uh, go and send no more or something to that degree. But he addressed her personally. Wisdom will show you even when to address people, how to address people. If he would have rebuked her, he would have crushed her. He would have destroyed her. And the men would have went back to their wives and would have preached and harped on. Yeah, your Jesus. So, and so I mean, you can imagine how that conversation could have gone. OK, but he addressed her privately after each of her accusers had gone. He addressed her. Go and sin no more. That was wisdom. There were other occasions in the word of God where uh, there was one occasion where they asked him a question. Let me see if I wrote this down. And this is I'm really going over in my time, but I, I'm going to have to take my time with this because um, to break it up right now, would be doing this teaching is a disservice. So if you got to go and go to work or go whatever, I get it. Just come back and listen to it later because uh, we're going to finish this up real strong. Um, but there was an occasion where the religious rulers asked Jesus a question and it was about paying taxes. Because they knew every Jew hated paying taxes. And so they said, okay, we're going to trap Jesus up. So they said to him, you know, uh, well, you know, what should we do about the taxes? And so, you know what Jesus said? He said, well, whose face is on the coin? <laughs> that, was, that was a wis wisdom answered. 
They were trying to trap him up the same way. You don't have to pay taxes because you know what? Uh, Caesar's not your king. You know what I'm saying? He tried to trap them up. Thank you, Michelle. God bless you. He tried to trap them up. And so you know what Jesus did? He said, you know what? Whose face is on the coin? And they said, Caesar's. And so Jesus said, well, I'll tell you what. Render unto Caesar's that which is Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Shut the whole conversation down. Wisdom. Wisdom will teach you how to answer your naysayers, people of God. Wisdom will teach you how to answer your critics. Now, I wanted to talk about Solomon. And this is found, oh, did I write that down? In 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Um, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to give you the context of it. Okay, this is 1 Kings chapter 16, excuse me, 1 Kings 3, 16 through 18. And we're talking about Solomon and the two mothers with the baby. Well, both of them had babies. And so just to give you a summary of it, if you're not familiar with it, please go back and read it. Very interesting reading. Okay, now this was after Solomon had received an impartation of wisdom in his dream. This was a dream. Okay. He received an impartation of wisdom in his dream. He said, Lord, I'm young. Cause you know, Solomon was the baby boy and there was a lot of controversy with Bathsheba and David because nobody wanted Solomon to be the king. That's a whole nother story. I won't even get into that. But at any rate, he felt insecure about his ability to lead. Nothing wrong with that. He took it to God in prayer. You're not going to feel secure. Thank you. Prophetess. You're not going to feel secure about every assignment that God gives you. All right. That's just human. You're not going to feel secure about every assignment that God gives you. So it's OK to go to God and pray and say, God, you call me to do this. I don't feel comfortable. I, you know, you don't want to be like Moses. Well, God, I stutter. I didn't finish school. My credit is bad. I've been married five times. You know, you don't want to give God a whole bunch of excuses. But what Solomon did was he went to God and he said, I'm young. I'm inexperienced. My, I was born out of controversy. You understand what I'm saying? And, and nobody really wanted me to be king. I'm a mama's boy. I did a teaching on that a while back, but whatever. So, you know, I'm a mama's boy and I don't really have, um, you know, what, what it takes to, to build this kingdom, to lead this kingdom. And so he goes to God in prayer about it and God reveals the answer to him in a dream. And he said, Solomon, what do you want? And Solomon said, well, Lord, you know, I don't know how to lead such a great people because Solomon knew the examples. I mean, excuse me, the mistakes his father had made. OK. And so he said, I don't want to make I don't. I, this is a great people. This is too much for me. I don't really have the, the know how to do this. And so God said, you know what? Well, what do you want? He said, well, give me wisdom so that I can lead this people. And so God says, you know what? Because you didn't ask for riches and you didn't ask for the heads of your enemies. I will give you wisdom. I'll answer that. But then I will also give you peace. OK, because Solomon uh, uh, reigned in peacetime. There was not one war. And this goes back to Proverbs 24, 3, how you wage your own wars. You get to govern your own wars when you have wisdom. There was not one mention of war while Solomon was in office. Not one mention of war while Solomon was in office because of his wisdom. And so God said, because you didn't ask me for money, you didn't ask me for the heads of your enemies. Uh, um. I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm going to also give you wealth. And I'm also going to give you the next of your enemies. Everybody bowed to Solomon. The queen of Sheba came to Solomon and brought him gifts and sat there as his student to learn. Show me, give me, teach me how to be a leader. My God. Oh, hallelujah. This is so deep today. Father, God in Jesus name. So, um, so, so here comes a situation to where Solomon has to put his wisdom into practice because it's not enough to have the gift and you don't exercise it. So Solomon puts his gift into practice. Amen. And so these two women come to him, both of them are prostitutes and both of them had a baby. Well, one woman rolled over on her baby at night and suffocated and killed the baby. And so she hid the baby and took the other woman's baby out of her bed and put the baby in her bed. So when the other woman, and I'm just paraphrasing, OK, so when the other woman wakes up and finds out, hey, my baby is gone. The other one was like, well, hey, I don't know what happened to it. I got mine. You know what I'm saying? So th this became a problem. Wisdom provides the solution. So now you can imagine they're scrapping, they're fighting, they're going at it. And so they go to Solomon for the answer for help. And so when they get to Solomon, you know, the, both of these ladies saying, it's my baby. No, you lying. It's my baby. And so they're going back and forth, tit for tat. And so Solomon says to the, to the guard, he said, give me your sword. And so he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Here's how we're going to solve this problem. I'm going to slice this baby in half and I'll give one half to one mother and one half to the other mother. And that'll end that both of you will have a baby. Now, of course, Solomon was not going to participate in fantasy. He was not about to be a baby killer, but he was using wisdom. 
And by the usage of this wisdom, he elicited a response a pure compassion from the true mother. And that's what he was set out to find out all along because both of them, you know, were postpartum. Come on, you know, everybody, you know, when you have a baby, you look like you had a baby, praise God. And so you couldn't tell whose baby it was because both of them looked like it just had one. Baby is apparently too young to really have any distinguishing characteristics. So you couldn't tell by looking at it. So now wisdom has to step in this godly understanding, a godly mind, a godly insight, a godly revelation has to step in to give us the answers to stop this quarrel, to stop this dispute. And so this is what happens. He says, give me a sword. I'm going to slice the baby in half, give one half to one mother, one half to the other mother. And the real mother cries out and says, no, don't do it. She can have it. And that was the determining factor. That proved who the authentic mother of that child was. And so Solomon said, take the baby from that woman and give her to this woman. And that settled that. It was the use of wisdom. Nobody had ever showed him to do that before. Nobody had ever showed him, well, this is what you do. If you ever have a situation where you got a woman with two baby, uh, two women with two baby, with one baby, this is how you do it. Nobody, so that's not textbook knowledge. That's not something you study. This wisdom comes from above. It is not sensual. It is not devilish. It comes from God. Okay. Oh, trying to close up here. Uh, we, we talked about a lot today. Uh, I'll tell you what. Even the deacon board in the, in the book of Acts was born out of wisdom. There was a problem. Uh, the, the Greek widows and the Jewish widows were complaining that they weren't being attended to. Okay, because remember now the church is forming, so you got Greek, excuse me, you got the the uh the Greeks coming in and you got the Jews that all try to mesh, trying to, you know, form this one thing. <coughs> and some of the uh Greek Jews, excuse me, Greek widows felt like they were being um uh uh what's the word? abandoned. They weren't receiving the same type of attention and care that the Jewish widows were receiving because it was a commandment. You got to take care of the widows. And so the Greek widows were saying, you know what? Um, in some versions, I may say the Hellenistic widows, but they're, it's Greeks. OK. And so um, they, they felt like they were being uh, 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 neglected. They felt like they were being abandoned. This is found in Acts chapter six. And, and so they were they went to the apostles and they said, hey, you know, we feel like we're being mistreated. We feel like we're being discriminated against. And so the apostles came together, Acts chapter 6, verse 2 through 4. The apostles came together and they said, look, you know, we're going to have to reason out this thing because. Hmm? Okay. We got to reason um, this thing out because um, we can't leave the study of the word and, and, and meditation and prayer to go and serve tables, you know, to feed these people. And, and it's, listen, it's not that they felt that they were above that. Let me just put that out there. It's not that they felt as if serving people was beneath them or taking care of the widows and cutting their grass was beneath them. That was not what they were saying. What they were saying was right now we are needed in prayer. We are needed in the studying of the word. We are needed in, in, in meditations because we're building something. And so it's not fit. In other words, it's not convenient for us to leave what we're doing to cut grass and to fix soup. So they said, let's come together. And let's pray and let's see what God is saying. So wisdom, wisdom birthed out of that conversation, the deacon board. And so this is where they said, you know what? Let's look among ourselves, find seven brothers of good report, good reputation. Listen, I'm going to read it to you. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word and the saying pleased everybody. You see how wi wisdom appeased everybody? Wisdom appeased everybody. It made sense. It brought a solution. It stopped the discord. It stopped the quarreling. It stopped the. If you enter into a situation and you're, you know, flowing in wisdom, you shouldn't leave and people are still trying to kill one another. When you, when you, when you depart from that phone call or from that situation, everybody should be in peace. And if not, your work is not done. So when they came together, when these apostles came together and said, Hey, this is what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and form a board and, and let's get these men, but let's make sure number one, they're full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Do you see how wisdom rides on the coattail of wisdom? Excuse me, of the Holy Ghost. 
They've got to have, they've got to be full of the Holy Ghost and they must have wisdom. And I, you know, I maintain to tell you, I think this is why we're seeing some of the, the nonsense that we see in the corporate body of Christ is that leaders don't know how to pray and meditate and seek God before they're installing people. And, 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 and the people that they're installing are not full of the Holy Ghost. They may be gifted. Okay, because remember I said there are natural gifts. Okay, they may be gifted, but they're not full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So they don't have the fruit. We talk about the gifts, but they don't have the fruit. They don't have the patience. They don't have long suffering. They don't have temper. That's why they're going off on people. That's why they're flipping off on people. They're going on Facebook rants and raves. You know, they don't have, they, they're not full of the Holy Ghost. And so as leaders, we have to build with wisdom. And this is why in the beginning when Moses appointed the elders, he laid his hands on them and he imparted the spirit that was upon him on them. Okay, so, you know, leaders, I'm talking to you now for a minute, that when, when you are installing officers, when you are ordaining your officers for ministry, you, you need to look for that. We need to look for that in those that we're calling. Are you full of the Holy Ghost? And don't tell me you got it. We need to see your Holy You know, can we see your Holy Ghost? Can we see the fruits of the spirit operating? Do you have love? Do you have joy? Do you have long suffering? Are you temperate? Are you patient? Do you have peace? Or are you always raging and always, always fighting? You, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, you can't serve right now. And then God help the ones who did flow in that. And then you do install them and then they go backwards. Now you got a, you got a problem. Because you got somebody in the office that no longer qualified for that. Now you got to figure out how to get that thing out of there. <laughs> Praise God. All right. So, so this is where the deacon board was born. Out of wisdom. It was born out of wisdom. It was born out of a problem. And so they established this office of the deacons. And they were able to return to the thing that they were called to do. Um. <sighs> One of the apost two of the apostolic prayers that Paul prayed is found in Ephesians chapter one, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That is what we call an apostolic prayer. It was an apostolic prayer. He wasn't praying for them to have a house or to get married or to get a promotion, but he prayed that the father would give them wisdom. As apostles, we pray, I constantly pray for God to give my people wisdom, not just for their execution of office in ministry, but in their life. Because if they make the wrong decisions in life, it's going to affect the work of ministry. If they marry the wrong person, it's going to affect their work in ministry. If they take the wrong job, it's going to affect their work in ministry. If they're clicking with the wrong crew, it's going to affect their work in ministry. So this has a, um, it has a rippling effect. And so as apostles, we pray for our people to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. And the second apostolic prayer that Paul uh, gave us an example is found in Colossians chapter one, verse nine. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. And spiritual understanding. These are what we call apostolic prayers. Okay. Um, James, the apostle James comes along and tells you, hey, if you need wisdom, you need to ask God for it. And he says that in James chapter one, verse five. So the gift of wisdom to sum all of that up for this hour and a half. Hallelujah. <laughs> the gift of wisdom is the application of the knowledge that God gives you. It's not just the knowledge, it's knowing how, knowing the when, where, how to apply the knowledge. You don't get wisdom from studying a book. You don't get wisdom from watching TV. You don't get wisdom even from fasting. This wisdom comes from spending time in the presence of God, time in prayer, and also in serving. You can receive an impartation of wisdom, and I gave you Bible for that. So there are two ways you can receive an impartation of wisdom. You can receive impartation by spending time in the presence of God, time in his word, time in prayer. Or you can receive an impartation of wisdom. Well, no, it's threefold. Three. Let me correct that. Let me correct myself. I stand corrected. Threefold. Spend time in prayer. If any man like wisdom, let him ask of God. So you're praying for wisdom. 
The second form is in, in, well, yeah, still born on prayer. So I guess it is too. I'm talking about Solomon, how Solomon received an impartation in his dream, but he did pray for it. So I, yeah, let me stick. I go back to my two. So prayer, God, I don't have wisdom. Give it to me. You promised me you would give it to me liberally and you won't take it back. You won't blame me. You won't accuse me for it. You know, I need it. So you receive impartation of wisdom through prayer. Okay, because you're coveting that gift. You go into God and you need, I need wisdom. God, give me wisdom. Father, I need wisdom in my marriage. I need wisdom with my children. My children are unsaved. I need to know wisdom how to save them. I need wisdom in my evangelistic office. I need wisdom in my apostolic. Whatever your thing is, God, I need wisdom. And you keep going to God. He said, the Bible said you have not because you ask not. You keep going to God until you see wisdom being uh, manifested. Because wisdom it, it will prove it. You can't hide wisdom. It's undeniable. I already said that. So you get wisdom by prayer. And you get wisdom by impartation. And I was saying three because I thought about Solomon with his thing in a dream, but he did pray for it. So I'll I go back to my two. <laughs> so two ways to receive wisdom, prayer and impartation. Okay. Um, the word of wisdom. Remember what I said? It is a revelatory gift. It is a revealing gift of the nature, the mind, the will of God, the intents of the hearts of God toward his people. And it works along with knowledge and it works along with uh, the discerning of spirits. So wisdom, the word of knowledge, and I'll talk about the word of knowledge sometimes later, but knowledge is information that you could not have known about somebody other than God give it to you. Okay, that's what the word of knowledge is. Many of you have been in services or been watching shows and somebody calls out somebody's social security number. Now, I don't know what that has to do with the kingdom, but anyway, that's just an example, the first one I can think of. Or you may see somebody say something like this. I feel like there's somebody here. You're having uh, back problems or back spasm. That's the word of knowledge. Okay, God, they're receiving information from the Holy Spirit that nobody had told them. And they're trying to figure out, okay, who, who is this person with this headache? Who is this person with the migraines? That's the word of knowledge. Okay, so, but I, I just kind of wanted to give you a little summary of what that is, the difference, because people get wisdom and knowledge mixed up. Knowledge is information conveyed to you by the Spirit of God that you could not have otherwise known. The word of wisdom is supernatural insight from God into a matter that brings a solution. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, uh, the word of wisdom is a prophetic gift. OK, it's a supernatural gift. It's going to reveal truths that were not known. And it's going to help you to accomplish God's will in a situation to bring peace, to bring solutions, to bring answers. All right. The gift of wisdom is a gift from God. It is not natural. You can't earn it. Ephesians 1 17 you get it from God through prayer and in Exodus you find that you can get it through impartation so that I think that's all I have um, for you today this has been um, hmm, a very in-depth teaching on the word of wisdom I pray that you were able to um, glean well from it and grasp an understanding a better understanding even if you have you know known the workings of the word of wisdom but I pray that from this teaching from this lesson today that you, you can have a better uh, understanding of the application of wisdom that you will be able to identify when you're in a conversation with someone and you hear wisdom. Because a lot of times we get so common with people that they're, you know, that God may be using them to to convey some wisdom to us. And we're so common. We miss it. You know, you, we just miss it. So um, prayerfully, you know, just in conversation, you will be able to identify, hey, that was a word. Of, I mean, you don't have to say it, but you'll know when you know it. That was a word of wisdom. God is speaking to me. Sometimes in people's messages, in many of my messages, God will, you know, use me without my knowledge. Okay, because many times, you know, in some cases, when God is using you in the word of wisdom, it's not like you get some big notice ahead of time and say, hey, I'm getting ready to use you in wisdom. You, it, it comes, it, it's a supernatural gift that works naturally. You understand? Know it's some. It's not anything that you crank yourself up and work yourself up for. You don't even have to speak in tongues or pray in the spirit. It's it's a resident gift, and so in a conversation with someone, if the wisdom just comes out. It, it just comes out, and you 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 will know it because you hear a person say, "Wow, I never thought about that before," or "I didn't look at it like that," or "Hmm, that makes a lot of sense." That's wisdom. That you just witnessed the manifestation of the word of wisdom. Okay, so it's not anything that you plan. It's not anything that you now, unless you're counseling, of course, you know, you're going to have to use some wisdom. Uh, but in terms of a conversation or in terms of ministering a message, you know, ask God, Father, in Jesus name, as I'm ministering this message, allow the word of wisdom to make um, impartation or allow the word of wisdom to express himself, to speak to the hearts of people that are dealing with issues that I'm not aware of. You know, Lord, allow the word of wisdom, the spirit of wisdom to flow freely in my message, to flow freely in my teachings. 
so that people will hear from you beyond my title, beyond the topic of what I'm ministering, but they'll hear a message that comes straight from you that can help them deal with the matter that they're, that they're dealing with. So the word of wisdom is a very powerful gift. Um, it's very downplayed. We hear a lot about the prophetic and everybody's talking about the prophetic, you know, but there are other gifts that are very powerful and very effective too that we don't want to dis, um, dismiss or disregard. So um, I, I bless you for listening. And I, it's my prayer that you have received an impartation of the um, workings of the word of wisdom. And that if that is your gift, that you will hone in on it and that you will uh, give it space to be used um, even more so. And that if you don't have to get the wisdom, but you would like to have that, ask God for it. Ask God for it and then look for it to be expressed. Don't ask God for a gift and then you don't use it. You know, ask, you know, ask him for it and then look for it to be used, put it into practice. So, Father, we thank you for this teaching today on the word of wisdom. God, I bless every heart that listened. It was a very lengthy teaching. But, Father, we know that it's needed for this hour. Your people need wisdom. Lord God, especially leaders, emerging leaders. Um, as Solomon so eloquently prayed, give me wisdom that I may lead this people. Many, Lord God, are building. You said, Lord God, that wisdom builds her house. As Father, many are building careers, many are building marriages, many are building ministries and building uh, 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 businesses and so forth, relationships, families, networks, or whatever they're involved in, Father. I ask for the gift and the grace of wisdom that you would show them how to build. God, deliver us from every uh, uh, source of foolishness, deliver us from every trace of foolishness. Those who are in marriages, Lord, that are married to the unsaved, God, give them wisdom. Those who have unsaved children, give them wisdom. Those who are working with the unsaved, give them wisdom, Father, that they would know how to win, God, those who you've given them influence over. And God, we glorify you and bless you forever. Your name is greatly to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, God bless you. We are done for today. We look forward to coming back and joining with you next week. Same time, same place. God bless you.